Ibor model of neural networks. Uh, thanks to Florentine God from New York University. It's your time. Thank you. Screen. Okay. Um, so thanks to the organizer for the invitation and thank you for uh, putting together such a nice program. Uh, apologies for not being here in person. I initially intended to be here, uh, but I had to change my plans. Uh, and last thing before I start, please interrupt me with uh, any questions. It's hard for me to judge if uh, what I'm saying is making sense online. So please um, come to the mic, interrupt me, and ask if something is not clear. Um, all right, so this, this is work. Uh, done with uh, Brice Menard from Johns Hopkins University, Gaspard Rochette from École Normale Supérieure, and Stéphane Marat from uh, Collège de France and Flattering Institute. Um, I want to start by uh, going back to like the fundamental question, maybe in uh, mathematics of deep learning. Um, so let's look at the supervised learning problem where it's defined by, I think, four things. Uh, there is a probability distribution, P of X, for the input data. Uh, a target function f of x that we want to learn. Um, and how we're going to learn it, we specify an architecture, so it's space of parameterized functions. Um, and we have a training algorithm, which given a training data set, gives us a set of parameters. Um, and the goal is to estimate the generalization error, so how close f theta, my learn function, is close to f on test data, so new data point x that I've not seen during training, right? And the main problem here is the curse of dimensionality. When X is high dimensional, uh, we need assumptions on F and or P, so both the target function and the input data, uh, to be able to say something non-trivial about this generalization error to be able to learn, uh, which is also known as the no free lunch theorem. And so a natural question here is, what are the settings in which we can or cannot learn? So for classes of functions and classes of probability distribution, when can I learn um, and make this generalization error, let's say polynomial in the number of training points instead of exponential? I'm sorry, poly polynomial is a very small exponent. Um, and we have made a lot of progress on this going bottom up from the simplest setting and looking at more and more complicated settings, usually you know, put more structure on the function, maybe not so much on the priority distribution, uh, but we've made progress, but I think there's, two issues with this program, uh, which is you know, obvious to, I think, everybody, is that first, we don't have a model of F and P in real world data sets. Um, so we don't, we don't really know what kind of assumptions to put there, what kind of structure is going to allow us to learn and beat the curse of dimensionality. So we have some clues for if we are dealing with images, we know that there's some locality properties, perhaps some multi-scale structure. We know some kind of things like that, but this, this is not really very precise. Um, so that's the first issue. And the second issue is that we also care about more than just performance, right? We care about explainability. Um, so if your model has good performance, I would like to understand why. How, why, like, can I trust this? Uh, what, what, what were um, the basis on which the like, network made this decision? And robustness, what about out of distribution? <coughs> a, a kind of weird example or like adversarial examples, can I, can I understand the behavior of the network outside of the training distribution? Um, so in this talk, I'm going to do something slightly different um, than the like, analysis that I talked about in the previous slides. I'm going to perform experiments on networks trained on image classification tasks. So let's say we take ImageNet, great large image classification data sets, I take some CNN architecture, I train a network on ImageNet, and then I, I look at the train network and I try to understand what has it learned. Um, and what, what do I mean by this? Uh, here are some questions that we can wonder about this train network, so because somehow it, it, its weights encapsulate the knowledge that it has learned from the data set, right? It's statistics extracted from the training data we'd like to understand how the knowledge is stored, how does the network memorize or generalize uh, things about the, the, the task. Um, and so the first question is, what are even the relevant objects to describe the trend networks? Obviously, we, 
we have everything we want in the parameters, but can we find a more compressed representation? For instance, what are features what we usually talk about where we don't really know what they are, right? Um, and one thing that we would like to want to be able to do with these features is measure perhaps their dimensionality. So how much, what is the true size of the, of what the network has learned more than its parameter, it might be much smaller. Um, and we can, can we compare these features across networks? Can we answer the question whether two networks have learned the same thing or not? Okay, this would be a first step towards understanding what's what's in there. Um, and there's a major challenge to be able to answer these questions is that a function can be encoded in many different ways in, in, a, in a network because of internal symmetries. And for instance, an obvious one is that neurons don't come in any particular order and I can swap the order between different neurons and I get the same functions. So that means the model is not identifiable is another way to say it. There are many realizations of parameters that correspond to the same function. Uh, so that sort of complicates trying to understand what's, what's in the parameters because of all the symmetries. And the second thing is that there is randomness, uh, both in the initialization of the network and its training algorithm. We run stochastic gradient descent, which means that we get, there might still be a lot of randomness in the weights, especially when it's combined with the symmetries, right? So that I think that explains why like many people have tried to look at the weights of neural networks, which is something very, um, like very basic question. And that's, it's hard to see anything because of this randomness and these symmetries. Um, and so I want to ask the question here, what is random and what is stable across training runs? So let's say I run, I train twice the same architecture on the same data sets, but just with different random seeds. So I'm going to start with a different initialization for the weights. The data is going to be presented in a different order. And I want to know what is, what is in common between the weights that I get at the end of training, because at the end of the training, I, the two networks have the same performance, but the weights are clearly different. They're not equal one-to-one -to, -one, like, to the neurons, but maybe there is some more global statistics that are the same. Um, and another way mathematically to formulate this question is I want to understand what is the probability distribution of weights after training. So I, when I randomly initialize the weights, I have sort of an initial probability distribution for the weights. And then during training, this distribution is transported, right? It's, if we take the push forward of this initialization through training, we get a distribution of trained weights. And every time I train a network, I, I get a sample from this distribution. And I would like to have a, a model of this distribution to know what is deterministic and what is random. So let's begin an exploration. Uh, let's train two networks on the same task. So here I'm going to have two simplified CNNs uh, that are trained on CIFRA 10 uh, and they reach 80% test accuracy, which is, is nowhere near state of the art. I mean, here I'm in the simplified setting to sort of be able to see things clearly, uh, but it's still a non-trivial performance. Um, and let's look at the first, the weights of the first layer. Okay, so I have neurons for the first network and I have neurons for the second network. And each neuron is described by a weight vector that I can plot here as a dot in the plane. Um, and the axes here correspond to the input features. So here, this would be for different pixels, right? Each neuron has a little filter that I can see as a dot in, in, in that space. Um, and then the first remark is if we try to see whether these two networks have learned the same thing, is that there is no correspondence between individual neurons. Um, if I take a neuron in the first network, it's hard to find an exact match in the second network. Um, however, what we can, so we can maybe um, um, give up on this in very, very strict individual correspondence, but perhaps there is still uh, more global statistical correspondence. So that means um, perhaps these, you know, these uh, neurons have the same statistics. And in particular, I'm going to look at the covariance of weights of these neurons. The mean is not very informative, um, but let's look at the second moment. Um, so I, I can compute the covariance of these weights. So essentially I treat each neuron as a sample from some distribution and I'm going to compare the distributions by right, two moments. Um, so I compute the covariance and I can compare the eigenvalues and the eigenvectors. So in the bottom left here, are the eigenvalues as a function of the rank for the two networks and they overlap very much, so seem to be the same. Um, and here I'm comparing the eigenvectors. So how I'm doing this is that the x-axis corresponds to 
the eigenvectors for the first network and the y-axis corresponds to the eigenvectors for the second network. And I'm doing the inner product between all pairs of eigenvectors. Um, and the, if they were exactly the same, I would expect to see here um, a diagonal of one, right? It means that they are perfectly equal and, and the, they are orthogonal otherwise. Um, and these, this sort of um, dark diagonal here indica indicates that it's very much uh, the case, that these two networks have the same covariance uh, for the weights of the first layer. So we were starting to see some correspondence. Let's let's continue. Let's look at the second layer, um, see if it still works. Um, so in the second layer, I also have neurons that are defined in, in some space. They have some weight vectors as well. Um, and I can compare the covariances. And here I see something surprising, is that they have exactly the same eigenvalues. Again, here there are two curves that are overlapping. Um, perhaps you don't really see. But the eigenvectors are completely different. Here I don't I don't see anything, no correlation at all. Um, so it seems that there is no correspondence, but the fact that the eigenvalues are the same tells us that perhaps we're, we're, there's something we're not doing correctly. Um, and actually, if we if we look at what are the axes here in the in these abstract spaces, uh, they correspond to individual neurons in the previous layer, and because neuron in the second layer, they're going to combine features that have been computed by neurons from the first layer. Um, so each weight here, each weight vector corresponds to a weight for each individual neurons for the first layer. Um, but I've just said that in the first layer, the individual neurons are different between the first and the second network. Right? So this, this means that the axes in the blue and the red pictures are different. So it doesn't make any sense to compare eigenvectors. They are defined in different spaces. They're expressed in different bases. And so it shouldn't be very surprising that we don't see any correlation. But perhaps we can find a way to, to, do, to still do such a comparison in a more meaningful way. And to do this, I'm going to take a detour through activations, sort of understand how these two spaces differ. Um, so here's my input data, um, uh, our data set of here images, and are defined in, in the space, uh, spanned by pixels. Each axis corresponds to a different pixel. And I present this training data to the two networks. Um, and I get activations. Right? So for each image, I have a vector phi of x, um, which is just obtained by applying the weight matrix for the first layer and then applying a pointwise nonlinear sigma. So I have represented activations for the first network and activations for the second network. Um, and again, these activations are defined in a space whose axes are spanned by the individual neurons in the first layer. Right. So again, these axes are different, and so the representations are different. Um, however, um, there's something very interesting if we look at the kernels that are defined by these representations. So I take two, a, a pair of input images, x and x prime, and I look at the inner product between phi of x and phi of x prime, which is what we call the kernel. And this is going to be a sum over dimensions, which corresponds to neurons. So it's a sum over neurons in the first layer. And if I normalize things properly, you know that one over n, n is the number of neurons, this becomes an empirical average over the neuron population in the first network. So this is a statistic over the neurons. This no longer depends on individual neurons. This is just a statistic of the population. But now, because I've said that I can think of the neurons in the first layer as different samples, but from the same distribution, or at least I've shown that the covariances were the same, um, this means that I can expect these two inner products for the blue and the red network to be the same because the statistics, um, the empirical average, they're going to converge to the same expectation, right, over the same distribution. So the distances and the angles between representation, between activations here are the same in the blue and the red network. So even though they're expressed in different bases, the geometry is the same. I think of point clouds where the distances are the same. The only degree of freedom that I have is an orthogonal transform. I can find a rotation or possibly a reflection to align them um, so that they become very close. Okay, so this is the intuitive argument. Let me make this a little bit more precise, uh, but we, we can make this more precise. Um, so here is the, the mathematical, mathematical model of what I'm, I was speaking about. I'm thinking of neurons and samples from some distribution. So WI is the weight of the ith neuron in the first layer is a sample from some distribution pi. Um, 
And then we have activations, which are called random features because the weights are random, which are defined this way. So it's sigma of x inner product with weight vector wi, and it's a vector with n coordinates. I we scale here by n one over squared n. Uh, and the kernel is, is here. Um, when n goes to infinity, here, this uh, expectation, because of the law of large numbers, is going to converge to that expectation, which corresponds to a kernel that I'm calling k infinity. And I can always write as the inner product between phi infinity of x and phi infinity of x prime. I can construct on phi infinity so that this holds. Um, phi infinity is going to live in some Hilbert space. And essentially, what happens when you take this with n going to infinity? So it's it, it phi infinity records the output of every possible neuron that is a, a sample from pi. Um, and then there is a theorem, uh, which was I was talking about was about the convergence. Um, up to rotation. So let's compare this phi of x to this phi infinity of x. So here I have a finite number of neurons, and here I have an infinite number of neurons. Um, and I allow myself to rotate and, and, and change the space uh, phi by this alignment A, which is a partial isometry. Um, so A transpose A has to be equal to that. <coughs> and sort of mapping this Rn, phi of x is in Rn, to this Hilbert space here. Um, and the claim is that I'm going to be able to make this as small as I want when n goes to infinity. That is, the, the representations are going to differ by rotation. Um, and it turns out that this distance, which is called Procrustes distance, um, if you heard of this before, can be rewritten as a distance on the kernel. Uh, because, it, because it's up to rotation, it only depends on inner products or between angles and distances, again, the geometry. And this distance is called the burrs wasserstein distance. Uh, which is distance that comes up in um, um, quantum probability, I think, in, uh, in optimal transport. Uh, and this distance can be shown to decay to zero polynomially in n. n is the number of neurons. So this is sort of a law of large numbers, but in infinite dimensions, right? Where k is an empirical average, k infinity is the expected value, and they converge uh, to one another with respect to this metric, which is just slightly stronger than a Euclidean metric. So it's a, that's why we need some additional assumptions uh, to have this true. Um, but this sort of proves that, indeed, we have this, this convergence up to rotations, because now, um, uh, sorry, if I, if I go back to here, um, both networks are going to be close to this sort of infinite, infinitely wide network, and therefore, there is a, there is a rotation between them. Okay, does, does that make sense? Are there any questions so far? Yeah. No questions. Okay. Okay, so this is a theorem, but we can also verify this numerically. And this was first shown by these two papers by Ragu, Kornblith, and, and colleagues um, with, a, with a different metric. But here, with, with this metric here, we can also see this. So, so here, I have two different architectures on two different data sets, uh, these sort of scattering networks in, in ResNet, so C pretend 10 and ImageNet. And I'm looking at the distance, um, and this distance where I train for, for every possible width, I'm going to change the width of my networks. For every possible width, I train um, two networks. No, actually, sorry. I, I, I train networks of different width, and then I compare the smaller networks to the bigger one. Okay, and it, I compare them to the biggest one because I don't, I don't have access to phi infinity, so I just replace it with a very, very large network. And I look, when I, when I make these networks bigger, do they actually converge to the biggest network? So this is this distance here as a function of the width. And I'm looking at this at all layers. Right? Blue corresponds to the first layers and orange corresponds to the last layers. And I see that indeed it seems to, at least it decays with the width. Um, perhaps here for the last layers, it's, it's not so clear, but, but we, this is also something we observe experimentally and not just at the first layer, at every layer. Right? So this is a true phenomenon that networks seems to, even though they have different activations, they have the same kernels or they have the same activations up to orthogonal transforms. Okay. Um, so now that we understand this, let's go back to the weights in the second layer. Now that we understand that these two axes are are not the same, but that they are this they are essentially the same spaces, but just expressed in different bases. Um, and we know now how to map the this sort of the blue space into the red space. So using the same alignment, this partial. Uh, isometry that I computed on the activations, I can map 
this the weights in the first network to equivalent in the second network. And now I can compare meaningfully these two covariances. Um, so once we do this, of course, the eigenvalues don't change because this just a rotation doesn't change the eigenvalues, it changes the eigenvectors. But once we do this more meaningful comparison, we see, now we see something, right? We see there, there's correlation, at least for the early ranks. So the eigenvectors that corresponds to the largest eigenvalues. Um, so it means that now we're doing something more sensible. And indeed, we see a lot of correspondence between the two networks. Um, so we can wonder whether this, this is just a partial correspondence. Like what about the later eigenvectors? Are they, are, are they important? Or are we, are we happy with the fact that just the first one are the same? Um, so one way to check this is to um, compute the accuracy of the networks when we project their weights to a lower dimensional subspace. So I do PCA on the weight, I do what we call clipping. I, I project the weights of, let's say, the blue network on the first k principal components, so the first k eigenvectors of the covariance. And without any retraining, I just look at the accuracy as a function of k of this rank. So obviously, when the rank is large, I get the maximal accuracy because I'm not doing anything. Uh, but we see that the accuracy remains large for a very long time. Um, or, or if I start from zero, it increases very quickly. So I actually need only 30 eigenvectors in, in that case to get most of the performance. Um, so this, this tells us that it seems that this, this first eigenvectors, the largest eigenvalues, they really correspond to what has been learned, the learned component of the weights, whereas the rest is perhaps just a residue of the random initialization. It does not carry any information that is useful for performance. And another way to check this is if I look at this, the spectrum of the covariance, the, the eigenvalues, here I did in dashed lines is the spectrum and initialization. So this is essentially the Marchenko pastor uh, distribution just plotted as a eigenvalues as a function of rank. So if you, if you want, it's the quantile function. Um, and we see that it, it seems to overlap for the late ranks. And it's only for the early ranks that there's been a departure or change in spectrum for, from the Martian Pastor initialization. So again, this is a confirmation that perhaps only this part has moved during training is, is informative. OK, so I've, I've I've done this for the second layer, but now I can do this for any layer, right? For the third layer, it's going to be the same. I'm also going to have to compute an alignment on the activations, and then I can use the alignment to compare the weights. And we see the same thing at, at all layers. So the, the summary so far is that um, the tra tra traditional way that people think about networks and try to compare them is to think about individual neurons. Um, and so to compare networks, we need to use permutation symmetries because the network the neurons don't come in any order, so we we need to match neurons from one network to the other. So that there's an optimization of our permutations here, and I'm arguing for like in in this case uh, what I'm trying to do here. I think is an, another approach uh, might be more useful is to compare neuron distributions, and in this case this is very closely linked to rotation symmetries in the activations as we've seen because of this convergence of the kernel. Uh, so this is sort of a coarser view, right? Instead of individual neurons, it's global neurons. And instead of permutation symmetries, it's the larger rotation symmetry group, which is also continuous and, and somewhat nicer and for optimization for, for purposes. Um, so the picture is that when I have two networks that have been trained on the same task, each layer is sort of randomly rotated with, with respect to um, each other, uh, which is a result of the random initialization. So if I compare them directly, I don't really see that they're similar. But with this alignment procedure, if everything is aligned, then I, I, I see a lot of correspondence between the two nodes. And we've seen that the central obje object to describe what's happening here, if we don't care about these, these random rotations, is to look at the geometry defined by the hidden activation. So let's forget about the basis. Let's just look at the geometry, or in other words, the kernel, that I think is really the central object to understand what's going on. And my message in the, in the mathematical model that I talked about is that in the infinite width limits, there is a unique deterministic network. There is no longer anything random because of the law of large numbers. It's just about expectations. Um, and finite width networks can be seen as random discretizations of it. In some sense, we have an expectation it's an integral, and we're doing a Monte Carlo approximation of it, if we think in terms of the kernels. This, this is one way to think about what the networks are doing. Okay, any questions so far? <laughs>
a question? Oh, yes, I make up here. Yeah, you can. Please, thanks. So, how does uh, this reasoning apply to um, interesting architectures such as not just feed forward neural nets and also cases where a uh, learning landscape is very rigged? Uh, for example, in the context of images, there are interesting standard examples of adversarial attacks, like changing a couple of mm -hmm. pixels takes you from panda to gibbon or from cats to guacamole. So um, what about that? Okay, thanks. Very interesting question. So two parts. For architectures, um, here, I've, mostly, I've treated networks as um, indeed like feed forward, fully connected or, or CNN, it, it also works. Uh, there are many questions about, yeah, what happens with other architectures? So let's say if I have attention, so if it's attention blocks or if it's recurrent architecture. Um, so I have not looked at these architectures. Um, I expect a similar version of this to hold because I think like if, if I go back to the, um, where, where is it? Um, yeah, to this theorem or like this, this result is really based on on um on the law of large numbers and whenever you have matrices in an architecture and these matrices can be arbitrarily large i think this phenomenon can happen uh, if we think of the rows of the matrix as independent samples from some distribution um there there are going to be there are going to be a concentration right of course in, in practice there you have no guarantee to be independent but they are most of the time have to be exchangeable again because of this permutation symmetry so so I expect this sort of concentration to happen very generally, but it remains to be seen exactly how it happens in recurrent or, or architectures or transformers or things like that. Then for the second part of your question for adversarial attacks, I just want to point out here that this, this convergence, if you look at the metric, this is average in mean square over X, the input, and it's for X coming from this distribution PLX. Okay, so I'm, in particular, I'm not saying anything um, about distribu about other distributions. Um, so this this is this is not like an L, L infinity uh, categorization, right? This is sort of a weak convergence. It's only uh, over most inputs x from some probability distribution. Uh, so for adversarial attacks, it might be very much the case that phi of x could be very different from phi infinity in some parts of the space. Um, this is just yeah. This is just um. This is just over a distribution. Um, and oh, and let me add a precision here that when I computed these, these distances, um, I computed the alignment matrix over the training sets, but then I reported the distance over the test set. So this is this is not an overfitting issue. You can you can still verify that that this occurs um, over X's which do did not use to compute the alignment. Um, <coughs> so it's it's um Right, but it, but it remains to be seen what happens for adversarial examples. For instance, this is not a direction that I looked at. Ah, thanks, thanks for the question. Okay, um, so let me now talk about what the rainbow model is, and then I'll explain the name later. Um, so it's a model of the probability distribution of the train weights, and it's a model. So in particular, it's going to be wrong, and there are going to be assumptions that are very restrictive. But the goal is to start somewhere. Um, and so this model is defined by weight distributions by L for each layer um, and activations, these phi L infinity, which are activations which corresponds to some kernels. Um, and once you, when, once you give me these two things, here is how I, I sample from the model. So here is how I draw a sample of a random network from the priority distribution that's defined by this model. And it's defined iteratively, so starting from the first layer, um, the first layer is easy. Each uh, weight of each neuron is going to be an ID sample from this distribution by one. <coughs> okay, but but this is this is for the other layers. The things are a little bit more complicated. Um, so in, for the second layer, I'm not directly going to take samples from pi two. Um, I first look at the activations because now that I've defined the first layer, I have access to the activations after the first nonlinearity in my network. Um, I have activations phi of x phi one of x, and I'm going to compute the alignment to phi one infinity of x. So I have this matrix A1, this is partial, partial isometry. And so for the second layer, I'm not going to take directly sample from pi two. Uh, I call that W2i prime, 
and I'm going to rotate these samples are going um, according to my alignment. So we can sort of think of this as a way to chain different layers. They're not independent. Right? Layer two is not independent from layer one because of this A1, which depends on the weights of layer one. Um, and it's sort of a rule to chain um, to chain different random features together. Um, and next slide, I'm going to have a visual description of this. This is this is sort of the, the mathematical description, but uh, things are going to be clearer in next slide. It's just to give a precise description. Um, and then so on for the other layers. So I, I again look at the activations phi 2 of x, and I can align them to phi 2 infinity. And then this tells me what to do for the third layer, where I'm going to use the matrix A2 and so on. And before I, before I look at what we can do with this model, there's a theorem that underlies this construction and said that like, at least on first um, first look, it makes sense, is that this alignment procedure is going to be exact when the width, so the number of neurons that I take in each of these steps goes to infinity. Um, so this is, this is the same th theorem as the previous one. It's just uh, you can iterate it and apply it at every layer. And it doesn't matter Then all the layers are finite. Um, the errors don't, don't really uh, compound, like they compound in a nice way and they all go to zero. Um, so that this this file goes to infinity. So so this is really this is really starting from an infinite width network and discretizing it randomly. Um, this is really Monte Carlo approximation, but chained at every at every layer. Okay, so let's let's look at how we use this in practice and and to verify it. Um, and to use it in practice, I'm going to make an even stronger assumption, uh, which is that this distribution spiral are Gaussian. Um, I, I haven't said what the piles are, and we know it's it, we know this is the assumption is not true in general. There are many cases where it's wrong. This is just again just as a way to check how far we can go with the simplest things we can do possible. Um, so I'm going to start from a trained reference network to define my rain, my Gaussian rainbow model, and the distribution piles are going to be Gaussian, and the covariances are going to be estimated from the weights of that network. And the activation <laughs> pi and infinity are going to be estimated from the activations of that network. Again, we could do uh, smaller things, but this is this is just a first step. Um, so here is how I sample from my model. I'm going to sample a new network, and then I'm going to evaluate its accuracy without training. So for the first layer, I just estimate the covariance of the first network, um, and I draw Gaussian samples. From uh, I, I draw samples from the Gaussian corresponding Gaussian distribution for the first network. For the second layer, I'm not going to use directly the covariance of the second layer again because the axes are not the same, right? So it, it wouldn't make sense. Um, so I need to go through the activation. So here is my input data. Here are the activations. I compute the alignments between my my sample, my new generated activations, and the one that I have from the train network. And I use this alignment to rotate my covariance matrix. And this is this rotated covariance matrix that I'm going to use to generate weights for the second network. Okay, so this sort of parallels the way that I compared two networks before, because we've said that it's not true that the second layer covariances are the same. They are the same after alignment. So this is coherent with what we were seeing before. Okay, and I can do that for all the layers. And here what we see, um, I take a CNN. I'm not going to take any architecture. It's, it's important to be a bit smart about the architecture. I'm going to take a CNN with fixed spatial filters, uh, which are called scattering networks or learn scattering networks on C10. So that means that the Gaussian model is only on channel weights. So it's it's a CNN. The weights apply over both space and channels, and I separate them in two. I factorize them, and the Gaussian model is only on the channels. And the reason is that we know that the spatial filters are not Gaussian. Uh, they have much more structure. If we look at the weights, uh, the filters learned by, let's say, AlexNet, they have they have a structure. They have a lot of structure. They are localized in frequency and so on. So they are not samples from Gaussian processes. Uh, but it turns out that we don't need to learn them. We, we sort of can fix them to wavelet filters, and this does not cost anything in accuracy. But but I'm not going to make a Gaussian sample. I mean, it's only on the channels. Um, and this is a, a model that's that's good when the width grows large. So I'm going to train networks for a different width, where I scale all, all the, the width of all the layers. Um, and so in blue is the accuracy of these trained networks as a function of width. Um, and it's pretty stable. Even, even for now in networks here, it's, it's still pretty high. And it goes up to 92%. Um, and in the dashed red lines, 
is what happened when I, I do the procedure that I just described. So I use this reference network to generate a new one by sampling from Gaussian distributions. And then I just evaluate on the test set. And again, I'm not cheating because the alignments first don't look at the labels at all. And they're computed on a train set. And here I'm mean, looking at the accuracy on the test set. So, so there's no overfitting going on. And it's we see that it's a lousy model for, for now networks, but as the width grows large, the accuracy increases a lot until it reaches 85%, which is starting to be pretty close to 92. And if we just retrain the classifier, so I just allow like a linear learning, I keep the kernels up to the last area, just retrain the classifier. I'm able to recover most of what I've lost and I go up to 89%. So even though with this Gaussian model, we know it's too simple, um, this is at least one setting where we can show that we reach very non-trivial accuracy with this and shows that in, in these covariances, there is, a, there is a lot of information about what the network has learned. We don't really need to look at higher order moments of the weights here. Um, and we have a lot of degree of freedom because every time I, I repeat this procedure, I get a totally different set of weights and they all reach the same accuracy. So sort of sampling the, the set of weights that all lead to good accuracy. And I've shown that all the networks that we get by training have more or less the same covariances. And here I'm showing that all the networks that have more or less the same covariances generated by this procedure have the same accuracy. So we're sort of characterizing this, this probability distribution of trained weights. Okay, so if we take a step back and look at the, this model, so why are we calling it this, the rainbow model? Uh, the reason is it comes from signal processing. In signal processing, uh, when you have noise whose covariance is the identity, we call this white noise. And when the covariance is not identity, we say that it's colored. It's like the, the noise as a spectrum, uh, just for, like for light. Um, and so here we have covariances for each layer and they are very different. So we have each layer a sort of different color and this gives us the, the rainbow. Um, and if we look at what each layer is doing, um, so it's computing random projections, right? From each, each, each neuron is a weight from a random distribution, but these random projections are all clustered in some low dimensional space because the covariances are not identity. So the eigenvalues decay, right? And they, 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 it means that the, the neurons are mostly spanned in a lower dimensional subspace. So I can sort of dis disentangle these two things, factorize the layers in two things, where there's first the action of the covariance, which is projecting the activations to a lower dimensional subspace if the covariance is low rank. And then within that subspace, I get white, white random features. So I, I do random exp expansion. Um, I sample a lot of random features in that space um, and I apply nonlinearity. With the nonlinearity sort of increases the dimensionality. Um, so when we look at the network is doing, it's sort of a sequence of um, dimensionality reductions because of the covariances and expansions because of the nonlinear figures. Um, and we can think of it as, as if the network was doing some sort of zoom on the interesting, interesting subspace, right? You, you identify something that's interesting you get rid of everything else and then you blow it up so that it occupies again the like whole dimensionality that you have at your disposal and then you start again and sort of zoom in on, on the interesting parts um, until you get to a point where you can just do a linear classification. So in, in conclusion, I've, um, I've treated trained networks and indirectly real world data sets because when we look at the weights that have been learned, we're really seeing the data set through the lens of training, right? These are all statistics about the training data. And I've treated them as objects of scientific study. And sort of like going back to my first slide is trying to understand what are the properties of real world data sets? What is the property of the input data, of the target function? What is the network learning? Uh, can we sort of characterize these things? Um, and I think the relevant concepts that emerge are the kernels is the most fundamental object. And these kernels are defined by the weight statistics. Not really, once we have networks that are wide enough, um, we, it's only the weight statistics that matter, not, not necessarily the individual neurons. And going back to my question, what has been learned? Um, so I propose one definition of features. Of course, there are many others and it depends what we're interested in. But for this work, features can be thought of the principal directions of the weights. Okay, and so we can measure the dimensionality come from the the eigen spectrum of the weight covariances, um, the smaller, the, the faster the decay, the lower dimensional it is. 
Um, and we can also compare the similarity across networks, which is what I was doing when I was comparing sort of the pairwise inner products between eigenvectors. Um, and I've shown also that they are linked to performance, both through these clipping experiments so that like, we can make low dimensional projections of the weights and retain most of the accuracy. And also this rainbow resampling procedure where knowledge of the covariance is enough to get, get almost back to training accuracy. You don't need more than this. Um, but I'm, I'm leaving open a very big question, which is like maybe the million dollar question. And this, how do these weight principle directions depend on the training data, right? I've, I've told you what the, what is the ob what the object is, but I, that does, doesn't mean I still understand them. Um, I would like to understand how they depend on the training data. Uh, what kind of knowledge do these feature, these, these principal directions encode of the training data? This remains to be seen. Um, and I also I think also that this model opens many questions now, uh, both in optimization. So we can ask about the regime of validity of the model. Can we show in some cases that this model is true or perhaps approximately true and true in the infinite width limit or something? Um, because one important thing to note is that this rainbow model, it's valid initialization. At initialization, we draw each layer independently from a Gaussian white distribution, so covariance identity. Uh, but this alignment procedure that I've described doesn't change anything. You can rotate the identity, it's still the identity. Um, so it's true at LNDD, and then an obvious question is, can we show that it's preserved during training? Or can we use somehow this assumption as a way to like, assume that it's stable and then be able to say something about what happens during training? There's also questions in generalization. Um, we, this defines classes of kernels, the rainbow kernels that emerge from this model that come from iterated random features. Uh, but contrary to most, and like most analysis, in previous work, consider random features with identity covariance. And I think this, this low rank covariance, which creates dimensionally reductions in between the random feature expansions are really important. Um, so the question is, can we investigate these properties and show that perhaps they are, they are beneficial for generalization? Uh, this is for, for future work. Um, I'm going to finish by thanking my collaborators and uh, thank you for your attention. Thanks, Randy.